first, of course, it's fight or flight, right? And you're just in the situation and you just deal with the situation. And that night after the incident, I thought I was going to go back into the house and sleep there because I was stubborn and I was in shock and I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know left from right at that point. And then, you know, the sun goes down and I'm uncontrollably shaking and I'm in a hotel room under an alias name because I'm so paranoid that even though he's arrested, he's somehow going to find me. And I have a the dresser pushed up against the door. You know, I made Mandy slide the dresser in front of the door on the 15th floor of this high rise. Hello, hello, Heel Squad. Welcome back to another episode here. I'm very excited about this episode because a very dear friend of mine is joining me. I'll share that in a moment. But first, a quote of the day, adaptability. And that's how I describe our next guest. Adaptability. Adaptability is about the powerful difference between adapting to cope and adapting to win. And that is Max McKeon. I love that. Uh, Heel Squad, it's going to be a great day. And we are going to learn so much from my friend today. Um, we have my friend Daria Barana. Oh, shoot. I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, we've been saying Daria's name wrong for years. It's Dar Daria. 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 So I, I said that. You didn't hear me. Okay. 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 So, um, and so we chose this quote because my guest Daria is a very adaptable. She's very malleable and we'll learn all about her story and you'll get to see why in a minute. But again, like I said, today we have Daria Baranato, aka WWE superstar, Sonia Deville. She's also an actress and an entrepreneur having launched Mandy's Donuts while building a vast real estate portfolio. In addition, she is a survivor having endured an armed home invasion from a would-be abductor. Besides being an inspiration to all, she is someone Kevin and I have known for nearly a decade and someone we consider family and love so much. Daria is here to share takeaway on all of the above, as well as how she and her new fiance, Tony, manage their long distance relationship, what it's like to be a stepmom and how to balance career and relationship while staying true. Please welcome my little sister, Daria. M.M., this nice. is so special. And hearing you give that whole diatribe in the beginning was like making me tear up. And I was like, why am I getting emotional? But I think it's just because I've been through so many different phases of my life with you and Kev by my side. So it's kind of like very full circle sitting here now. And I'm getting misty, too. I, I, I don't we know. We love you so much. I love you guys. And I feel like, I don't know. You know, I've had, oof. We have to catch up. This is so exciting. Yeah. So Daria comes into town and usually you stay over, but I know you've got yeah. like pride stuff this weekend. So you're, yeah. you have to stay nearby. Um, and we have our sessions and we all like catch up <laughs> on everything and help each other through stuff. And so um, I've definitely gone through a lot since I saw you last, but um, I do feel like you are ride or die. Always. And I've been broken hearted by some ride or dies in my life yeah. but I think you are officially a ride or die forever yeah. well the way I look at our friendship and I always have is like you guys are family like it's more than that you guys are family you started off as mentors and acquaintances and you've literally become like my west coast family when I lived out here by myself and now it's like we share so many pivotal big moments together even if we're thousands of miles apart and don't talk for two weeks or two months it doesn't matter we catch right back up and I sleep in the guest bedroom still when yeah. I come. Um, and so, yeah, it's just so crazy how we stay so connected even when we're so far apart. Yeah, well, I, I think that that's a credit to you because you have such an insane schedule with the WWE that you make the effort to make sure that we get to see you because otherwise it would be impossible. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think it's been it's been a really cool journey to see you. Um, you know, when I say adaptability, one of the things that first came to mind was when we first met you. Mm -hmm. You were a fighter. You were in was it UFC? Am I crazy? Right? I now? was tr fighting MMA. In, MMA yeah, that's in the word. amateur leagues. Yeah, the letters, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I was like, 
it's not UFC, but it's something like that. Okay, so <laughs> MMA. Mm-hmm. And I remember we went to a Ronda Rousey fight mm-hmm. and I was like, oh gosh, you're too pretty to be hit in the <sighs> face. Like, I just don't think this is the right thing for you. Oh. And soon after we were in a meeting and we heard about, um, oh, what was the show? Tough Enough. Tough Enough. The reality series. Yeah. Competition show. And they wanted you to do it. Yeah. Originally. And I was like, not me, <laughs> but I have someone that's going to be amazing. And then Kevin had to call you and mm-hmm. just talk about adaptability. Here's someone who has been f- training to be a fighter and is very focused. You're not someone who's like a fly by the wind kind of shifty. No. You are very determined and very focused. And Kevin's like, I need you to listen to me. This is your path. <laughs> Whatever he said, you yeah, can no, even say. No, he did. He called me and he was like, hey, D, I have something to run by you, but I want you to hear me out before you say no. And I was like, oh, gosh, what could he be asking me right now? <laughs> and he's like, um, there's this reality show called WWE Tough Enough. It's a reality competition series. And you compete for a contract to get signed with the WWE. And I was like, wait, like wrestling? Like the fake stuff? And Because in my mind, coming from an MMA background, I was like, I didn't know much about it besides The Rock and John Cena, right? What I'd seen on TV. And so I was like, it's a competition reality series to compete i mean like i'm in and he's like wait that was easy and i was like well it just feels right Mm -hmm. and i was like as long as it's not going to intercept with my upcoming fight right so i thought i was going to go do this tryout um seventeen thousand people tried out for the audition that i was a part of crazy so i was like there's no way i'm getting on this show i'm gonna go do the tryout i'm gonna give it my it's gonna be a great life experience and if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out i mma is my life and then (laughs) Three weeks later, I was being told, hey, move to Orlando. You're signed with WWE NXT developmental brand. And I was like, what the heck? And it was the craziest whirlwind ride. And I remember actually having to make a decision um, between an amateur title fight that I was prepping for. I was in fight camp for um, or saying yes to the show. And I actually had to choose before I knew I was on the show. So I was like, okay. I made it to the second round of tryouts, but I'm still one of like 5,000. Do I tell this fight promoter, sorry, I can't take this title opportunity for your promotion, which would have been a huge opportunity for me at that time in the MMA world, um, in, in my life, in the scope of things? Or do I gamble it all away and go to this tryout in Orlando, Florida and maybe get on this show? And I remember really struggling with it because MMA was my heart, soul, and passion. Mm-hmm. And I chose to go to the tryout because something in my instinctual gut was just telling me, you got, you have to do this. You have to give it, a, give it a shot. And the rest is kind of history. It worked out. That was almost nine years ago. Yeah. Kevin's so good at knowing stuff. He's such a visionary. And he knew that you would succeed wildly there. And yes. he knew that that could be a really big career for well, you. You guys saw that path far before I did. Well, we were fans of WWE. Right. So we knew, and you, but Kevin yeah. really knows. And so now looking back, <laughs> are you yeah. happy you did it? Or do you wish? Because the thing I think is cool is yeah. Ronda Rousey came to WWE. So and ironic. A lot of UFC fighters and MMA fighters came over. So yeah. it was the big, you were the first. Yeah, I was the, the first champs, fe- female MMA fighter to make the transition. It, it's the crazy, the whole thing is crazy. It's crazy. And the that, first LGBTQ to, to female, come out yep. on, on in WWE. Yeah. And, and when these things are happening, like you don't realize it in the moment, right? Like I didn't realize I was doing something special by having an MMA background and transitioning into WWE as a female. Like I didn't realize any of these things. But like you said, Kev and you, you guys are creators and you guys are visionaries. And I knew you had my back was like the, the end all be all. Like that's what solidified to me. Like I trust this path. Cause I trusted you guys and I trusted myself to a degree um, to follow my, my heart where it went and WWE is where it went. So you're happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> I love my job. I tell everyone, all this, when people are like, do you like what you do? I'm like, I get paid to travel the world, work out and wrestle for a living. Like that, that to me was always the dream. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be a performer. I was a child, a lifelong athlete This is literally the culmination of my passions and desires in a world I didn't know existed prior to 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a dream. Yeah. And adaptability, like, applied in so many things. Like, I remember one time you were here 
and I had been watching you and I was like, hmm, we need to start working with an acting coach. And she just <laughs> listens instantly. It's like there's no questioning. She's in. And and you then took everything to a whole other level. Your character in WWE on whether it was Raw or um, SmackDown. This makes me get my face so emotional right now. I'm getting emotional because I'm I, getting the chills. <laughs> we were in your kitchen, 10 feet away. And you and Kev sat me down and no one likes to hear critique, you know, especially at the thing that you're working endlessly to perfect. But you guys always keep it real with me. And, and you guys were like, I don't think it would hurt to get an acting coach. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm on the road five days a week, though, Maria. Like, what do you want me to do? But I didn't say that. I was like, OK, well, how do we make it happen? You guys hooked me up with Sean Whalen. He did virtual sessions when I was in town. He did in-person sessions. And it wasn't six months after that conversation at your kitchen counter that I called Vince and Vince I said, McMahon. Vince McMahon. And I said, I, at, now up at, up by at the way, for the Heel Squad, who's like, you know, we talk a lot about yeah. like health stuff. Sorry. Vince McMahon is the chairman of WWE. Yes. He's the owner of WWE. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so calling him is a big feat. And yeah. so I was, um, I up until this point, my career had been very physicality driven. I was the MMA chick. I was the MMA fighter. I was tough and rough around the edges. And they knew that I was physical and could go in the ring. But no one had really seen me talk on the mic or my acting abilities up until this point, um, which ironically is something that I've always felt comfortable with. I just didn't come. I wasn't hired to be that. I was hired to be the ass kicker. And so. I called Vince and I had been pitching so many different storylines and I finally called him. I said, sir, I was in this storyline with Mandy, my best friend, and um, it was a heated angle. And I called him. And I said, sir, can you please give me one opportunity to show you that the passion and and the um, intention that I give in the ring can translate to the microphone? One promo. Give me one promo segment on the microphone. If I shit the bed you can take the mic away forever. And this is what I said. And I'm rambling and I'm rambling. And, you know, he just said, OK. And we hung up and I was like, oh, that was embarrassing. Like, uh, but whatever. I had to put myself out there. And if but I that's fail, a I think... huge thing. People don't have the courage to ask for what they want. Yeah. And if you don't ask for what you want, friends, you will never get it because we think yeah. that somehow we're at the top of everybody's minds. We're not. Everyone else is just struggling to get their day done. So if there's something you want in life, you have to go out and ask and ask respectfully. Yeah. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and you know, and go from there. But um, I think it's so important. I think where the fear comes from is obviously like the fear of rejection, right? Like no one yeah. wants to be told no. But something I've always done and I've always been like, I don't know if you call it ballsy, but I've always been like a yeah. risk taker since I was a kid. And my mentality on it always is, though, like, I will be OK if they say no. I will be OK if I fail. I like that. Because every like my pattern of my life and I talk to my fiance about this all the time, but like the pattern of my life has always been like fall down, fall down, fall down, trip, fail, fail, big success. It's mm. always gone that way. So I don't actually accept success now without those bumps. Like if there's no bumps, I'm like. Something's wrong. This doesn't feel right. It was too easy. Um, just because I've, I've learned to embrace the failures. I'm like, they're going to come. They're going to happen. Whether it's in real estate or in the food industry or in wrestling, like I know the bumps and the trials and tribulations are going to come. So like, bring it on. Let me get past the failures so I can get to the success because I know it's waiting there. I love that. You know what I mean? You though? just gave me something because my motto has always been ask and you shall receive. Mm. And most of the time I I do because I think most people are scared to ask. Yeah. So then the I'm the one like, you know, random one that does. Not afraid so, to ask. So it happens. Yeah. But I also do have a fear of rejection. I don't yeah. like hearing no. And I mean, just in terms of like something that's personal where you're going to be like, but hurt, not no, I can't have that cookie or whatever. Right, right. Um, so I like the what you just planted in my head is I'm prepared to know they could say no and it's okay. Right. And it's and it's part of the journey. Whereas I feel like a lot of us get tripped up because we think everything's supposed to be perfect and everything's supposed to just happen. Right. Um, I'll never forget I had Anastasia Soar, the eyebrow queen, love and guru in studio, and she goes, 
problems happen. What is wrong with us? Why do we think problems are just these unique situations? A hundred percent. They just happen and you have to figure out how to roll through them. How are you going to be adaptable and shift? Yeah. And and get through it. So okay, he called Vince. He gave you the the, so, the promo. He said yes. He said, well, he didn't say yes. He said okay, and we hung up. And oh, so I didn't okay. know. You didn't know what that meant. No, I didn't know any. I didn't know what it meant at all. I go to TVs the next week. This segment that was supposed to happen with somebody else ends up getting canceled because they were sick. Whatever happenstance. This was universal happenstance, manifestation, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they called me. The writers, you know, called me into the office, and they were like you're going to have like a six minute solo promo in the ring with man, you and Mandy. And I was like, six minutes is a long what? time. Long time, <laughs> especially for two stars at the time. Like neither one of us was at the top of the card yet. We were both, you know, in the middle trying to make our way to the top of the card. So to give us that spotlight and it was during the pandemic era. So there was no crowd. So it was pin drop. Oh, silent, oh that's right. I remember, which this. is really it funny. So hard. Yes. <laughs> But I remember, um, anyway, I, I wrote it myself. I, well, I worked with one of the writers and I, and I wrote a lot of it and I went out there and I've never felt so confident and I delivered it. And I remember I walked off stage and Miz was standing backstage and he was like, that's one of the best promos I ever heard. And I like started crying because I was like coming from him, someone who's great on the mic and he's amazing, amazing, been around for so long. I was like, wow, I find, and Vince said something nice to me along the lines of like, good job like you delivered and I was like that to me was such an accomplishment because I was like I didn't always want to be known as just the ass kicker I wanted to be well-rounded I wanted to show people like I can do it all yeah. I can walk the walk I can talk the talk I can wrestle I can I can do it all and I can, you want to grow you want to grow exactly and so that was like a pivotal moment in in my career and my humanity in general like just who I am it made me feel like taking those risks is always worth it, whether it's failure or success. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to ask you because I feel like the Heel Squad will really benefit from this with yeah. you because it's one of the things I most admire of you. Um, I mean, I admire a lot of things, but <laughs> I really love your courage to stand up for yourself. Mm. So in my career, and this is like, we're always mentoring and giving advice, but then sometimes some comes my way and I'm like, ooh, okay. I wish I had this before, but one yeah. of the big differences in our journeys is I was terrified to stand up for myself in my career and to my bosses. Um, I might have made some little little teeny efforts, but you have always had this confidence in you where you just knew it was going to work out, or I don't know, you'll have to share it and explain it to everybody, but I was terrified. I, you know, I had my parents I had to take care of financially, and so I always led from fear, and yeah. didn't get to protect myself when there were injustices. So will you share with everybody kind of how you, where that came from? Did you learn it from your family or is it something just you either have or you don't? Yeah. And what can you share advice-wise with everybody? So I'll just say from my experience, because I don't know particularly where it comes from or why, but my 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 older sister calls me a justice warrior. And it's funny because I'd never heard that term. But when she said I was a justice warrior, I was like, that is the most accurate statement ever. And I'm proud of it because what, what what it means to me is that and it's true about my personality. Anyone that knows me can tell you right is right and wrong is wrong. And I'm very big on equality. I want everyone to have a fair shot. And I think it may stem from being the middle child growing up. Mm -hmm. I kind of got it from both sides. And so I was able to kind of give and take. and. I just feel like I'm really big on everyone getting a fair shot. And so if I feel like something is unjust um, to the person that I am inside, like I hold that very dear to me, like how my boundaries, how I should be treated and respected um, has nothing to do with where I'm at on the totem pole or, you know, and I, I believe in seniority and things like that. I'm not saying that, but like, Despite my job title or where I'm at in the pecking order, respect is respect. And my dad always taught me, you treat the janitor the same way you treat the CEO. And that's something that I've always lived by. Yeah, um, I've always been like that. But people aren't always like that, too. People are not always like yeah. that. But I I will fight tooth and nail for what I believe in. That's just who but I am. How do you do it? Because I think that's 
the tough part is the application yeah. of it because it's it's really hard. Like I said, I've I've had so many injustices. Yeah. And you're not a troublemaker. You're not no. someone who is going to like try to burn them down. You do it in such an eloquent way. Well, I just feel like if there's a hill I'm going to die on, it's going to be my for justice. Like I'm I can lay my head on my pillow at night and go to sleep feeling great about myself if I know that I stood up for what was right. Even if it's sacrificing an opportunity or turning down an opportunity or missing out on something that someone else is getting because I didn't play my cards right. You know what I mean? In 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 the businesses or whatever. But like I can lay my head on my pillow and feel good about myself knowing that I put the right energy out there in the world and that I respected myself and my body and my mind and my boundaries. And I've always been big on that. I don't really know why, but the how um, is just being proud of who I am when I go to bed every night. That's big. I have a conscience that weighs on me. I'm a very um, self-aware person. And so my actions directly affect my mind and how I feel about myself. And my self-worth is what dictates and drives everything that I do in my life, whether it's my family or my career. So I need to be proud of who I am. And by doing that, I try to take control over what I can control, which is how I'm treated and how the people around me are treated. So I will die on that hill for equality and justice any day, knowing that I can sleep well at night, being proud of who I am. I think <clears throat> the key here is you know the why. Yeah. So when you know the why, the how will come more naturally. Right. I think that's what I'm getting at is like, I don't, I don't know. I just do. Because I don't it. think I had enough self-worth, to be honest. Well, so, and, and I, if yeah. you have self-worth and you know you want to lay your head on that pillow at night and know that you, I didn't have boundaries until maybe two years ago in yeah. therapy, I started learning boundaries and we had no boundaries. And I know that every woman listening to this is yeah. like, yes, me too, me too, me too. It's hard. So, we want to learn from you. So it, Well, it's hard. Yeah. And so many of us grow up in different sort of toxic situations, whether it's parental or familiar with your mm -hmm. family or whatever, the, you're not like really taught boundaries and, and self-worth and self-esteem. It's kind of just something that is an evolution and a process and therapy helps. I've been in therapy for years and I swear by it. Um, it's not for everybody, of course, but I really have benefited from it. Just the self-awareness from it. I love talking things out and I love taking blame for the things that I do wrong. It's some weird thing I have about me that like when I mess up, I liked now I'm stubborn with around about some things. I'm not going to say that, but like I really like taking blame when I'm wrong, even if like it puts a knot in my stomach and I feel crappy about myself in that moment. I'll feel better knowing that I was honest and didn't let someone else take the the burden of feeling like they were like in wow. in my relationship like I like to justify Tony when I know it was me that did something wrong so I I need to let her know like no like it's okay that you're upset right now because I I was just like being rude or whatever it is because I need her to know that it's not her wow because I don't want her to go internalize that and become insecure about something that has nothing to do with her needed to learn that one too. <laughs> All right. There's a few things I'm going to add to my list. I think it's Kevin's just, getting excited over at the table. Wow. She's going to admit she's wrong. Wow. I just, <laughs> you do. I feel like you and Kev have a very great dynamic and I've always kind of looked at that as a great example because you guys are fair and kind to each other. Um, and we all have our moments, but like yeah. you guys are kind. Um, and you know, you're on some couples and you're like, Ooh, they're kind of mean to each other. You guys obviously don't have that energy, but no, I'm, I'm just big on, just owning my 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 crap, you know. I don't like there to be any kind of facade. There's no smoke and mirrors with me. You get what you get. Some people enjoy that company, and some people it it rubs them the wrong way, and that's okay. Yeah. Because if you're okay with who you are at the end of the day, then you can just be you. And like that's my favorite quote is like "be you" because everyone else is already taken. And we were talking about that a similar concept earlier with Kevin, but like if you truly hear that and believe it, like. You have to be you, Maria, because everyone else is already taken. You're not meant to be a little bit thinner, a little bit bigger, a little bit blonder, a little bit more, you know, you were meant to be you. So how can you try to be someone else and miss your path in life? I know the hard thing is, is that I think all of us want to be liked. 
Yes. And so that's where the disconnect comes from yourself is you want to be liked. So then you, you try to become different things for different people and you lose yourself. So how do you, how do you feel like you have stayed true and maybe even, you know, your path even having to to come out and and own mm-hmm. your sexuality, I don't know if that helped empower you. Yeah, but I feel like it did. No, absolutely. <laughs> well, I have like this big theory on self worth that I've had since I was young. I I really think that um, making yourself proud of you first, whether that be finding yourself a career path or just a path in life in general, I think that's like the sole most important important first step as when you're growing up as a young woman or a young man like I think that needs to be figured out first and I'm not saying you can't fall in love or have kids or whatever but for me like I needed to figure me out first like I knew I needed to be secure financially and I needed to have a secure space that was mine before I could give anybody the better version or uh, the best version of me I needed that self-worth like I needed to go to work. I needed to pay my own bills. I needed to buy my own groceries, like the simple things. I needed all that for myself before I could commit to somebody else because I needed to feel like I could take care of myself. And you know where this is coming from. And it's, it's, the story doesn't make sense unless I give you some backstory, but, um, my mom, I grew up seeing my mom in a situation where, um, she worked my whole life and she was very hardworking, but she was financially reliant to a certain extent on a partner for a certain extent of my life. And so I saw her in situations where finances um, dictated her decisions, her emotional decisions and her personal situations. And I hated that for her. And my thing was like, well, why don't you just do whatever you want and be, and she couldn't because of certain circumstances. And so I took heavy note of that and it took a big effect on me um, as a young woman to be like, I will never be financially reliant on anybody but myself because I need control over my own physical space at the very least. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because you have your freedom. You need your freedom. You need your freedom. And maybe everyone doesn't need it to that extent, but that's what I needed. And that's what empowered me to feel good about myself and certainly coming out for sure, because that was a part of me that I hid for a while because um, I didn't know it. I didn't grow up in a community or a neighborhood that there was openly gay people. I didn't know any gay people growing up. And so when I started having these feelings and these, um, the, yeah, these feelings, I was like, no, it can't be, you know, I was denying it myself. And so finally I moved out of my hometown and I explored and I got out there, um, LA and that definitely helped. Um, Cause I was just like a fish in the sea and I just had to start swimming cause there was no one there to catch me and no safety net, which, um, was really helpful. And then, yeah, once I started speaking my truth and said it out loud on tough enough, um, I was like, well, it's out there now. So now I just got to live it. When I live it. Yeah. So that, yeah, it was definitely part of that journey. Um, P.S. If you're watching this on YouTube, lots of little flies in here. We're getting right now attacked by because flies. we we have doors open earlier. Um, they're very small flies, though. Yeah, they're little guys. Um, you talk about security and and finances and mm-hmm. all of that. Oh my god, this bug! But um, one of the other things I loved about you is, and anybody I mentor in my life, I'm always like, save your money, yeah. invest your money. Yeah. So we would have sessions where I'm yeah. like, you have to save your money. And you're such a, such a gangster with this. And I'm so impressed. Um, and only because, uh, in the intro, we talked about your real estate portfolio. I wanted to just, (laughs) you know, have you share, Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many women out there who, um, maybe don't feel comfortable in all of that, but like you, you started with one and then you just kept building from there. Can you share kind of a path for people to to do this and get involved? Um, I think it's just like anything else in life that we were talking Which, about. Which, by the where... way, she did this, guys, mm. working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, mm. on the road, nonstop. I don't know how <laughs> in the heck you did this with your schedule. There's no one that works harder than wrestlers. Literally, they don't stop. And they're always driving to the next location, flying to the next location. Yeah, They're always in transit. How you were able to figure this out, I don't know, but go ahead. <laughs> I, I Well, it like happened by accident, I feel like, but... um. 
I built my first house um, when I was, oh God, like 23 or 24 um, that I was going to live in forever. So I thought, um, and I became obsessed with the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is a real estate podcast. That Bigger what? Bigger Pockets. Oh, okay. It's an amazing real estate podcast. It breaks most things down in layman's terms, which I needed because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I became obsessed and I started learning like the fundamentals and I would listen to this binge listen to this in my home gym hours on end during COVID and the pandemic era and just became obsessed with it. And the one thing I learned from listening to so many episodes and reading so many books and audiobooks was that you can gain, you can get as much knowledge as you can from this literature and such, but you eventually have to just dive in. And if there's one thing in my life that I another thing and, you just dive in, you're not afraid. The yeah. rest of us are afraid. <laughs> but that's it's one thing. I I think now my confidence to dive in is a little higher than it was diving into WWE at whatever 21, because I've seen that my risks eventually do gain reward. And I think that confidence is built from you know, trial and error. You build it slowly. Yes. And so it's not like always like I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this is a big risk and I'm just going to do it. No problem. Like, no, I I weigh the pros and the cons. Um, And if it makes a little sense to my brain and it's scary, I I do typically still do it. Um, And so I built this house. I was living in it. um, And then the break in happened, which is. Oh, it was. That's right. I was yeah. trying to think in my head. I'm like, I feel like it was that first house. Yeah. In Tampa, Tampa, Florida, um, a break-in happened and unfortunate situation. And I was forced to vacate it. And so what do you do? You rent it out. Um, so an unfortunate situation turned into a fortunate uh, effect, which I was making, you know, a thousand plus dollars a month in profit off this house that I was renting out. And so I saw that firsthand and I was like, wait a second can I just like keep doing this and keep? And so, so I saw the strategy accidentally laid out in front of my face. It was kind of like the real estate gods were like, you wanted to jump in. Well, here you go. And I was like, okay, well, if I just duplicate this until I get to a monthly income amount that I'm happy with, then God forbid anything ha- were to happen with my, you know, my W2 job, so to speak, even though it's not a W2 job, but, um, my, my day job, um, I'll be safe and my family will be safe. And so I slowly started building on that. Um, I acquired a short-term rental, an Airbnb in um, the Disney area. And then I bought myself another primary residence. Um, I later sold the Tampa one and ended up making great money off of that. Um, And then I was like, I met my fiance. She was really into the real estate too. And then we decided to flip a house. And so we tried house flipping and that's been fun. Um, And now we're looking to open a pizza business. Ooh. Um, so we're kind of just diving in. <laughs> Kevin at the table is like, I can't wait to hear about the pizza business. So friends, so many scams. Um Derek uh, so came many. and the first thing we did was we sat down to do the show. We have not caught up on life yet. So no. we're literally catching up in a sense right now. I saved it for, uh, for yeah. this for okay. all you guys. Um anyway, um, so Tony and I are very similar in a lot of ways. Our aesthetic, as Kevin likes to point out. Is one of them. Oh, we'll get to um, that. We'll get to that. But um, but yeah, we're very similar. She's very headstrong. She's very independent. Um, she has always worked and hustled and supported herself. And that's something that I obviously admired about her when I first met her. And so one of her dreams since she was a little girl was to own a pizza shop. And one of my dreams since I was a little girl was to own an Italian restaurant. <laughs> so it's always been Kevin's dream to be in a pizza shop. Kev has wanted to be in the pizza business for so long. <laughs> that did not go unnoticed, Kev, by the way. Um, and so as we're doing real estate and finding our little niche, in, in, you know, in this market that we found in, in the Northeast, we were like, wait a second, we can own real estate and operate a business. Um, and so I think we might do a little pizza shop coming soon. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Tampa. Mm -hmm. I don't want to dwell in this, but, uh, I know that that was a really traumatic event that took place. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you showed me video footage of you face to face with this man who's breaking into your house and then later find out he had all the instruments Mm -hmm. to hurt you with and, and abduct you. 
that was such a horrible moment. I remember Kevin wanting to get on a plane instantly. We were terrified and I know you were terrified, but you acted so quickly. Like you were able to escape and, and luckily we're okay. What did you do since then to heal? Have you healed? Um, tough. Oh, it's such a loaded question. No, I can't. Um, I laugh when I'm uncomfortable, but um, it, it's such a it's such a loaded question because it happened over two years ago. Um, it recently ha- was just legally settled, um, so I haven't really been able to talk about it for the last few years. Um, he's in jail. He's in jail for the next twelve and a half years. Thank God. Yeah. Um, so it's weird. So it's weird because we were supposed to go to trial, right? And then, <clears throat> right as the trial date was approaching. We ended up, um, he ended up taking our plea deal, um, 15 years in jail, followed by 15 years uh, strict probation. How did you feel about that? So bittersweet, right? Um, Avoiding the trial and reliving it all obviously was a goal of mine. Um, I didn't want to rehash it, but I didn't think a plea was even an option. So going into it, I was so mentally prepared for the last six months, eight months to face it head on and get this like clean cut resolution and be done with it and like I was almost like just like I guess it goes hand in hand with who I am but I like to face things head on and I like to like just the dragon and slay it uh so to speak and so I was kind of like mentally prepared to go to court and face it and have to tell my story and to see a conviction and to feel the definitiveness of the conclusion, justice. the justice, right? Full circle. Um, and yeah, so it's bittersweet. I, I was mentally prepared to do that. And then it went a different way. And I'm very grateful, uh, um, of the outcome. You know, I think it's great. Um, and my lawyers are, are happy with it. So I, you know, trusted their advisement and I think, I think it's good, but, um, yeah, I was just mentally prepared for something else. So that's, a little weird um thing that i went through recently with it um but it's there's been so much um and i haven't talked about this at all yet so it, there's just so many you yeah, know there's and i told you years ago you're the person that i feel most comfortable with to ever talk about it with um there's just so many layers to it um first of course it's fight or flight right and you're just in the situation and you just deal with the situation and that night after the incident I thought I was going to go back into the house and sleep there because I was stubborn and I was in shock and I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know left from right at that point. And then, you know, the sun goes down and I'm uncontrollably shaking and I'm in a hotel room under an alias name because I'm so paranoid that even though he's arrested, he's somehow going to find me. And I have a the dresser pushed up against the door. You know, I made Mandy slide the dresser in front of the door on the 15th floor of this high rise uh, hotel and uh, you know and paranoia starts to set in and then mandy's her was her wrestling partner at the time and her best friend was and sleeping over that night home. yeah she was in the house that night um as well and so you know it's fight or flight and then it's shock and then you know you go into an autopilot or i went into an autopilot of like what need, and I'm I'm like this with everything. What needs to be done? What do we have to do? Like I don't feel first. I do first, and then I feel later. You mm-hmm. can relate. I understand. Yes. Yeah. Um. You know, you do what has to be done, and then you feel later. So I didn't feel the full effect of what had happened for months because I was in full blown fight or flight. I was living in fight or flight mode for months, maybe years. Um. And I didn't realize that until. Uh, so I actually went and not, no one knows this either. I went and lived in a safe house for a month because we didn't know if he was going to be able to get bail or whatever. Um, What's that like? What's a safe house? I mean, it was a 24-7 armed security house. I mean, guys with guns wow. standing at each door entrance of this home in a secured location um, 24-7. And I just just a constant reminder. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just weird. And I would go work out at the local LA fitness and he would come work out with me. Um, 
Anyway, so that was a weird phase of my life. I didn't know what was going on. My mom flew down and stayed with me for as long as she could. But then she has to go back to work. My dad came down right away, of course. Then he has to go back to work. And so it's this really weird thing where something so messed up happens to you, but then life goes on. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was hard for me to deal with at that time because I am such a ride or die and I um, I feel my emotions very hard and true. And so I'm like, wait a second. I just almost had all this taken away from me and then life just goes on. And I'm assuming this is how a lot of people in these situations and work. Yeah, it's trauma um, feel. And so anyway, um, life went on and I had to find a secure place to live. Um, you know, the weeks following the incident, I was talking I mean, I was dead serious. It's funny now, but it wasn't funny then. But I was like telling my dad, like, I'm I'm buying a house on all this property and I'm digging a moat and I'm going to put a moat around the house with armed security guards 24-7 and I'm going to get these attack dogs. And I did the research and they're this much money and I'm, I'm going to have like five of them because you need two. And like, I was full blown down a rabbit hole of like, just, yeah, I was very scared. Um, but this was all, I was still in like game mode. I was still in like, this is what needs to be done. This is what we have to do. Um, and then finally, after the safe house, I moved into a high rise because um, that was the more affordable option than the moat and the dogs. <laughs> and so I moved myself into a high rise and um, uh, work gave me time off. Um, I didn't know I wanted it at the time. I was like, no, I want to come to work. And they were like, why don't you take some time? And I was like annoyed at the time, but obviously it was for my benefit. And so um, it wasn't until I moved into the high rise by myself that I started to realize how bad it messed me up. Um, I was, I became nocturnal. I would stay up until the sun came up and then I would start sleeping. Um, you know, I went and got myself a gun. The sheriff helped me get it. I got my license to carry, my right to carry, all that stuff. And I would just sit in bed with my gun in my hand in this, again, on like the 15th, on the ninth floor, whatever floor I was on. Um, and I would sleep every night with my nightstand pushed up against the bedroom door. And then my stainless steel trash can pushed up against the door to the hallway of the apartment building in an armed guarded apartment building. Um, it was just full blown paranoia. And so that, that was when I started sinking into the feeling of it. That's when I would, I don't even know if I cried still. I just would be scared and it would, you know, I would relive it, I guess. Um, and that went on for (laughs) six months or so. And then, yeah, and then I moved on to the next phase of my life and I got a roommate, one of my best friends, Phil moved in with me and then things started to get easier and I had people around and having people around is, I think what helped me ultimately heal and a lot of therapy. Um, yeah. And just, uh, chugging along and working and doing what I have to do and trying to give myself grace when, you know, I'm acting a certain way and I don't recognize the emotions. Um, during that time period, I, I think it's when I finally let my body relax. I was hospitalized with some unknown stomach condition. And I know you're going to find this very interesting because you're all into this. Um, my dad had to fly down because I was down there by myself and I couldn't get out of bed. I was 102 fever. I remember. Yeah, you remember. I talked to you and kept this whole time. Um, I was laying on my shower floor for like an hour and a half, just letting the hot water run on me, like shaking chills. Um, just really, really bad stomach pain. Went to the doctor. They told me my colon was inflamed. Went to a specialist, got an endosco- endoscopy, got a colon, like all these things. And, you know, all the tests were coming back. Like, we don't know. Inconclusive, inconclusive, inconclusive. And it wasn't until like a year later I was like, oh, mind body was we're all connected here and so that was the biggest physical effect i felt and that's when i realized i had almost metaphorically or literally been probably gritting my teeth and clenching my jaw and clenching my fist for a year just being in that panic trauma ridden state that my body was like finally gave up on me and was like, we can't live like this, Daria. I mean, I was not I was staying up all night. I was sleeping three hours a day, maybe. I wasn't, I wasn't good. And I'm so stubborn in that sense that I would never have admitted that. And 
but also becomes normal. It just is your normal, right? Because we as humans, we're we adaptable. <laughs> and we adapt and we move on and we do what we got to do to survive. That's just what we do. And so it took a physical illness for me to be like, oh, I'm not okay. And then I manifested finding a roommate that made me feel safe and become my best friend. And then he popped into my life like two months later when I went to find a personal trainer. And he was this young, fun, he became like my little brother. And he lives with me for two years and we healed together and we worked out together and we were we went to the beach together. I bought a Rottweiler and we just, he definitely helped me heal. That was like my yeah. healing journey until I met my fiance. And now, you know, it's all on the up. Now, having gone through all of that, do you feel like in your day to day, you think about it still? Are you afraid still? Do you have moments? How does it, um, how does it work now? No, I mean, I, I like to go to, at a fast speed. And I don't know if that's to block things out, you know, but I, I go at a fast pace. So I have little idle time that I sit and really stew on it. Um, I will say that I have secured my life physically in a way that everyone that I love can feel and be safe um, in our home. Uh, you know, I've taken a lot of precautions to literally secure my home and my surroundings um, for me and my fiance and our family just to make sure that that's not a constant worry or fear. Obviously, at 2 a.m. when I hear the dog bark or, you know, whatever, it, those emotions are still there. Um, but, yeah, we do everything that we can to to make sure that we feel safe and secure in our home environment. Yeah. Well, because I remember the alarm is what went off and you were aware <laughs> instantly. You were like, you know, Mandy. Oh, yeah. Alarm. Yeah. Right? So now if you hear the dog, the, you're going to be like, the dog's the alarm. I was, yeah, I was always so alert. Um, Like I could wake up from a pin drop. I'm just, I, you know, I guess I don't sleep very heavy. I'm always an alert person. So when the alarm went off in the house, the night of the break in, I was up within like. But just the fact that seconds. you had, <laughs> excuse me for laughing, the balls to go down there. If you hear, some, you know, your alarm go off and say someone's at your back door, I would run the other way. You <laughs> ran to it. It's. I don't know, Maria. And, and it's I, the creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I, 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 I can't even tell you. Like it's, I think it's all of our biggest fears. But then to see yeah. someone that you love literally be confronted by someone who the, you then you later hear had all these intense, yeah. horrendous intentions for you. Mm -hmm. um, that was really, really awful. Yeah. Yeah, it's messed up. Yeah. So. I, I'm grateful that you found your path to the other side. Um, I know that, you know, we can, we can heal from traumas. I'm sure to a degree, there's always going to probably be that cautiousness that yeah. you're always going to have to have. I wonder, does this guy have any chance of parole? No. So he's gone for 12 years. 12 and a yeah. So what do they say you do after? Because, okay, 12 years is you're, you're going to be my age. Like then yeah. you're going to be dealing with this again. What happens? He's on a strict probation. He's never allowed, you know, near me or my family, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no answer for that. And that's kind of like the dread. Right. And that's kind of like where I go back and forth and I'm like, oh, if we would have went to trial, would he have gotten longer? You know, but you can't think like that and you have to trust yeah the people who do know about that kind of stuff, my legal advisors and everything. And so I just have to trust that it is what it is for now. And in 12 and a half years, um, I'll have the means to protect my family in whatever way that I can. And that's just all I can hope for. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's so weird. You just never know how you're going to react in situations like that. And, um, you know, the thing said living room door open and it was like, at first I was like, okay, well, maybe Mandy went outside to take a phone call or something like went to Mandy's room and then Mandy's in bed dead asleep. So that was kind of when it was like, oh, it wasn't Mandy that went outside and it's 2.43 in the morning. And, it, you know, the thing says living room door open. And I'm like, well, I have to go to the living room door. And if it was cracked open, if someone like my thought was, I don't know when this thought came because there were so many thoughts. But at some point I was like. Okay, if the living room door is open, the alarm is blaring. 
If it's someone trying to rob my house at this point, they're running away. Of course, you don't stay robbing a house when the alarm is yeah, blaring. Right. Yeah, and you're not thinking abduction at that point. Of course not. It's the last thing never I in ever a million, expect. never in a million years. And it's a gated community. It's it's safe. It's safe. And so when I went to the back sliding glass door, I have two sliding glass doors and they're like perpendicular to each other. One is like the sliding glass door that opens all the way down the wall kind of thing. Like you have like an inside outside. Yeah. And then the other one's just like a normal sliding glass door. And they have they both have curtains drawn in front of them. So, so it's like long blinds is what blinds, I remember. Blinds, yeah. Yeah. I will never get that video out of my yeah. head. So when I run into the living room, the blinds are all drawn. So whether the door's open or closed, I don't know at this point. So I don't go to the long door because I don't use that door. I'm like, that's definitely locked and secured. If anything was left unlocked, it has to be this little side door. And so I go to the side door and I, you know, I you see in the video, I peel back the curtain and I go to secure the lock, make sure it's locked. And it it was locked. And I was just like fidgeting with it, making sure it was locked. And just from me looking down at the lock to looking up, he was closer than you are right now. He was right at the um, glass on your the face. Other side. And I was like, what? And I was so confused because I'm like, the alarm's blaring. You're dressed in all black. You have a mask and a backpack on. Something's in your hand. I couldn't see. It was a, it was a knife and mace. A knife and mace. Something like that. And something's wrong. But you don't know what. And then I ran. And what I didn't realize until I saw the video back was he had already had that other door open behind the blinds. Yeah, I remember seeing a door open. I thought it was the one you were face to face no. with. So I the one I was like... face to face with, the glass was shut, and I was just like securing the lock, like, "Oh, no one's out there, right?" And as I look up, he's right there. But what I didn't realize is that the other door was indeed still open. So when I ran to go get Mandy and to get out of the house, he ran after me, but he had a blind spot moment because he had to cross the blinds. So when he got through the blinds. He didn't know which way he, he went. He thought I went up the stairs, but I didn't. I went around the corner, grabbed Mandy, and went out the garage. And so when the cops came, he was waiting at the bottom of the stairs with the weapons in his hand. And they were like, you know, and they they asked him why he didn't go up after me or whatever. And he was like, well, she went up. I knew she had to come back down, so I was just going to wait for her. And he, <laughs> there was all kinds of stuff. He was he feared me because I had an MMA background, and so he did some MMA training apparently. to what? prep. Oh, it was like all kinds of stuff. I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know the full details because I've never read or listened to his full um, testimony or whatever you call it report. I yeah, guess he admitted to everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It unbelievable. Yeah, he was there to yeah do all the yeah. And there's then you go back and look at the DMs that I hadn't seen, but there's years worth of DMs, you know, and from multiple accounts that he had owned and. You know, they started off as just like creepy, obsessive fan, and then some were much, much more graphic, terrible, 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 depictive yeah, and things. And then explaining what he wanted to do. Yeah, everything he wanted to do. And the last message was something along the lines of, "Look outside, honey. I'm on your back porch waiting for you. I told you I would come." Had I seen that DM at at one a.m. or whatever time, me and Mandy were on the couch watching Bates Motel. Had I pulled out my DMs and seen that. Surely we would have thought it was a joke, right? We wouldn't have thought someone's actually on my back porch. That's yeah, so unbelievable. Crazy, crazy story, crazy journey. I can't believe it's almost is it almost been three years? I think this year will be three. So when people say, you know, in in all tragedies or whatever, there's some silver lining. Is there any silver lining here? Was there anything that you were able to make into lemonade. Yeah, I mean, I know it sounds. Yeah, I always so I joke around about it because I do like to make light of very oh dark deep things. You know that's, that's our jam. Is our line. That's what we that's what we do. <laughs> but um, you know it it got me started on my real estate journey. I ended up making great money off that house, which led to a new path to protect and secure my family. Wait. Financial security was your number one thing. And in this security breach, financial security came. Mm. That's pretty right. crazy. I mean, take of it what you may, but that is really what I took of it. I was like, also, I mean, there's a lot of layers to this, right? I mean, I moved to Tampa 
in a previous relationship, it wasn't right for me. It wasn't right for her either. Um, and I was kind of like stuck in the mud in and I was depressed and it wasn't going well. And it was, you know, it wasn't good. And I was stubborn and I, I'm a fighter. And so I'll, I'll stick things out even if they're not great for us. Right. You know, we mm -hmm. do that. Um, and so I also take it as a sign of like ripping a bandaid a little bit, like, okay, you're not going to leave Tampa and get out of this toxic situation and go back to home where you should be. We're going to rip it off for you. And that's might sound crude to some people or like dark, but like, I don't take it that way. I'm like, okay, I hate that that had to be my universal sign that I wasn't meant to be in this situation, but I was in a very bad emotional mental place living there in that house um, in Tampa before the be break in. Yeah. And I had to be forced out. So I look at a lot of little silver linings. Um, I had like a lot of epiphanies after this and I was, cause of course, why is your first question? Like, why did this happen to me? You know, you go through that whole journey. Um, and so which you can relate to with a lot of stuff that you've been through with your health and everything. Um, and so you go, why, 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 why? And I'm a very literal person. So I needed a why. And so I found a couple whys that, um, I don't know if they do do it justice, but it it helps, you know, to see those silver linings. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember when I got diagnosed with brain tumor after my mom had her brain tumor, I was like, oh, this was just God throwing bricks, being like, you're not going to change your life. You're not going to shift out of all of this. You're not going to slow down. I got you. <laughs> Let me just, you know, give you this little gift here. But sometimes it is the slow down, right? Mm -hmm. And I see that's so interesting because we're similar. We go a million miles an hour. Mm -hmm. We just want to work, work, work. We want to please and we want to do our best and we want to do everything. But it's like sometimes we do need to pull back and slow down a little bit and just take care of ourselves. Yeah. D, I love you. I love you more. So many great takeaways. I want to stop for a moment mm. and bring in Tony. Mm. And we'll bring in Kev. Ah, um, the best so things. let's take a quick break I and we that. will come back with our other halves. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.